<clears throat> All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. Actually, it's nice and cool in here. What is it, about 95 outside? Um, I've spent a lot of time in this state, uh, hunting mushrooms, fly fishing, backpacking, doing all kinds of fun stuff. I love it here. So it's great to be back. I've got friends here, some of whom came out tonight. Thanks, guys. Uh, I'm sure I've met a few of you before. Um, it's good to be back in Colorado. I'm going to take you on a tour this evening through my book, The Mushroom Hunters, um, which I'm really excited about a new edition coming out almost a month from now, a uh, new paperback edition. Um, it's my second book. Um, I've been writing about, I've been a wild food forager for the last 30 plus years. I guess I'm a little bit dense. It took me a while as a writer and editor to realize, wait a second, this stuff that I'm doing for recreation actually makes really good stories, uh, really good narrative, um, really interesting science, life histories. There's the food component, all these good things uh, kind of woven together. And so about 15 years ago, I realized, well, this is my subject matter uh, and started writing about wild foods. And as you can see, I now have a, a trilogy of books. Um, my first one was Fat of the Land, which is a collection of essays and stories about wild foods. And that had the germination in it for the mushroom hunters. Um, and uh, it basically, the, there's a morale chapter uh, in that book. Um, and, uh, oh, Seems that we have lost our ability to, to flip here. Um, presenter mode, but it um, we should be able just to click. No, okay, yeah, you're good. No, Is it just, working now? Yeah, yeah, just left and right. Yeah, left and right. Okay. Um, so there's a morale chapter in Fat of the Land uh, that took place in, uh, I guess, 2007, because we had this big fire in my state. I live in Seattle, Washington, uh, and in north central Washington, we would have really our first of what was to come. Uh, it was a forest fire complex that was over 200,000 acres. Uh, and now that's become commonplace, as you all know. Uh, but back then, it was sort of a novelty. Um, and of course, um, a lot of mushroom pickers uh, visited it the following spring looking for the bonanza of morels. Um, and I got in there uh, with my friends. And uh, as you can see, there's my friend, Chris. Um, we were sort of, you know, very amateurish and uh, we had our nice little kind of woven Guatemalan baskets, you know, and maybe we had a few pounds of, of uh, morels that we found. And by the way, I mean, just look at the habitat right there. That is not the sort of habitat that you wanna be hunting uh, when you're in a burn. We call this the hot burn and uh, it's full of ash. And uh, as you can see, lots of sort of dead trees and, and, and not prime morel habitat. But, but, you know, every now and then you would come upon a little, you know, bloom like that. And so, you know, we put a few pounds in our baskets and, and, and we, were, we were content with that, Rec recreational mushroom pickers. We were happy um, just to be sort of wandering around in the woods, finding something to eat for dinner. But there was a certain point where we came into a clearing and uh, across the way, two other people emerged into the same clearing, um, just as we did, except on the other side. Uh, so maybe they were 50 yards away from us. Um, but even from that distance, we could see that they had these rucksacks on their backs that were piled high with morels. And I would guess that each one of them had about 80 pounds of morels on his back. Okay. And I knew instinctively right away that these were commercial pickers, that they were out there. They were doing this for profit. They were, they were not like us. They, they were going to sell everything they had. Uh, and move on, you know, to the next burn somewhere on the mushroom trail. Uh, and that's how they were spending their summer and probably more than their summer. And, uh, you know, we sort of, I turned to my friend and we sort of looked at these guys and, and they looked at us and they were probably, you know, just as confused by us. Um, and uh, like, what are they doing traipsing around in here just for a few pounds of mushrooms? But, you know, I guess the question that just kept sort of burning itself into my brain was, how have they unlocked nature secrets 
to the degree that they can go out and find 80 pounds of morels, each of them. You know, I thought of it as sort of nature's Rubik's cube. You really have to get all the combinations right. Slope aspect, tree canopy, soil type, you know, weather conditions, seasonality, all this stuff has to line up perfectly. And then maybe like these two characters, you could really hit the mother load. And it just sort of gnawed at me because here they were, essentially in the same patch of woods, obviously hunting in some different areas from where we were, um, but, you know, skillful enough to be able to find huge quantities of mushrooms. So that was when I vowed that I was going to start uncovering some of their secrets. And I was going to get on what was sort of known as the mushroom trail. And imagine an area, um, it's basically the greater Pacific Northwest. It extends from essentially Northern California, say around Mendocino, all the way up the coast into Southeast Alaska, and then kind of east over to the Yukon and down through Western Montana and Idaho, um, and kind of you come full circle back to uh, Oregon and Washington. Um, in that area, I knew as these guys referred to it as the mushroom trail, you could pick wild mushrooms for the table 360 days out of the year. OK, there was always a mushroom fruiting somewhere. And these guys I knew led itinerant lives and they just moved from flush to flush. But I really wanted to know still how they did it. Um, so I got on the mushroom trail um, and basically, you know, my first book had been much more sort of personal. Um, but now this was sort of more of a journalistic enterprise. I was going to kind of gumshoe it, you know, really kind of worm my way into the scene and, uh, and get to know some of these characters and find out just how they did it. So I got on the mushroom trail and, you know, I started by just sort of going to festivals and fairs and things like that. And I didn't, I didn't learn very much. I mean, I saw cool stuff. Like I got to know a lot of lawn gnomes, you know, and I saw some pretty amazing um, chainsaw art, you know, and those toddler sized uh, morels right there will actually set you back a pretty, pretty penny. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I saw a lot of fun stuff on the mushroom trail in terms of the festival circuit, but these weren't the same people. These weren't the guys that were going into the woods and hauling out improbable quantities of fungi. Just the same, I ended up in Michigan. And, uh, you know, in Michigan, they really kind of think of themselves as sort of at the center of the morel universe. And they even have an annual hunt that they call the world's, you know, great morel hunt or something like that. And I boarded a school bus with all these other people. And I'm surprised they didn't blindfold me, but, uh, you know, we weren't allowed to have maps or compass or anything like that. And they took us to an undisclosed location in the woods and set us free and, and somebody blew a bullhorn. And uh, for the next two hours, we all tried to find uh, as many morels as we could. Um, and actually there was a very great consolation prize in these woods because I think I found exactly one morel that day. Mm -hmm. I was completely baffled by these sort of Midwestern woods, you know, where I live in the Northwest, most of our morel hunting is either done down in the, in the river corridors where it's cottonwoods mm -hmm. or up in the mountains with conifers. But here there was just a baffling array of hardwood trees and I didn't really recognize them. Um, but in the foreground, you see all that greenery right there. Well, that is a wild leek known as a ramp, um, which is an incredible delicacy. So if you didn't find any morels, you could harvest as many ramps as you wanted. And those were really good. I think the winner found something like 265 morels that day. So I continued kind of circulating around the country, going to the places where people were hunting mushrooms and talking about mushrooms and, and ogling mushrooms and all of that. And I ended up in Atlanta, Georgia, where actually I picked these right inside the metro area of Atlanta, if you can believe it. Big, beautiful yellow morels. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, this is a patch to plate presentation. So I hope you all have had dinner because I am gonna show you some slides of what I like to do with my bounty when I get at home. Um, so I'd been out on the trail a little bit, going to these different festivals, and I would get home with my catch, and I would make stuff like this. Here's some diver scallops that have been pan fried um, and uh, with a nice little nettle sauce there and some potatoes and morels. And I would, I would make stuff like that, um, which would kind of keep the engines humming along until I could get back out on the trail and continue to look for the professionals. Um, and it brought me to your neck of the woods. 
um, some of you might recognize this next spot. Um, certainly, you know, one of our best known mushroom festivals and with some really great characters for the sort of writerly sorts who are interested in those sort of people who you're going to see in the next slide here. Um, in fact, some of you might know some of these folks. Uh, I think I see Britt Bunyard, the, uh, the editor of Fungi Magazine in that photo, but I won't disclose which one. Uh, but anyway, uh, spent a lot of time with the mushroom people in Telluride, uh, including the white rabbit and the Amanita muscaria mobile, as you can see. And, you know, that's a great time down there um, in the mountains around Telluride. And you find in a good year, really great quantities of that lovely Rocky Mountain Porcini as well. Um, and I think uh, actually one of your colleagues uh, just found some, maybe I shouldn't be talking about this, but just found some maybe today or yesterday. You can talk to Greg later. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, I would uh, I'd get that home and uh, oops, um, make this sort of thing to, you know, kind of show off to my friends where I'd been and what I was finding. Um, in this case, just some really nice porcini that's been grilled in a simple kind of Italian fashion with a little garlic and olive oil and then, you know, just thinly sliced baguette with some ricotta which besides being a nice mild cheese to go with it, acts as a really good glue. So it holds the mushroom on there. So it doesn't go like flying off when you try to hand it to somebody and a little herb from the garden. And they would ask me about my adventures and I'd tell them about Telluride and Michigan and all of that. But you know, the problem was, is I was having a lot of fun with the recreational mushroom people, but I still was not meeting the people who were doing this for a living. And they remained kind of indistinct to me, like this guy, a little bit blurry, you know, I just didn't know much about who they were, where they were living, what they were doing. By the way, that's a very nice two pound lobster mushroom right there. Um, and uh, I just didn't know. And I just kept asking kind of friends of friends. And finally, I was able through many different kind of twisted connections that finally produced this next guy, Doug Carnell. And he was really the first commercial mushroom picker that I finally met uh, and who was willing. I had maybe talked to a few on the phone and as soon as they found out that I was interested in writing a book, it was just click. <laughs> uh, but Doug was really the first one that I met who said, sure, I'll show you how, how I do it. Um, so that's Doug Carnell. He's been a circuit picker for pretty much his entire working life. He's also captained a crab boat. He's scavenged for metal. Uh, he's dug razor clams. He's logged old growth cedar. Um, he's done all kinds of things. But the one job that's been a constant in his life for probably 40 years at this point is picking mushrooms for sale. And uh, he lives out on the Olympic Peninsula, or at the time he did, um, Westport, Washington. And he said, meet me at the 7-Eleven out in Hoquiam uh, on the west end of the Olympic Peninsula, and, uh, and I'll show you how it's done. So, and by the way, you can see, uh, not to make you nervous here, it was elk season. And, uh, and so he had his rifle with him. But you may have heard about a little bit of gunplay in the woods and We'll get into that later in the presentation. So Doug um, basically invited me into his world. And uh, I met him at the 7-Eleven and he got himself a big cup of coffee, which is pretty much his only nourishment in the field. Maybe that and a Twinkie and a cold hot dog. Um, and uh, we got in his, blue, his, his old used Buick uh, and drove up first on 101. And then from 101, we got on a country road. And then from that country road, we got on a kind of a dirt logging road. And then we got on a smaller dirt logging road. And then we got on kind of a spur. And then we got on what to me looked kind of like a goat path. And I could see sort of down in a little sort of um, kind of drop out that there was a big puddle of water. And he said, hold your breath. And he gunned the engine and we kind of rammed through it. 
and we pulled over at the other end and he checked to make sure that his radiator was okay. And, uh, and then we parked and that was that. And he pulled out a knife about yay long, which he bought for a dollar at the dollar store. And, uh, and he pulled out a bucket and those were basically his tools of the trade. And, uh, and at that point he just wandered into the woods. Now, this is really, this is the scraggly kind of working forest of the Northwest in Washington. Um, there are no trails here. You're not going to see hikers in this area. You're not going to see steelhead fishermen. I mean, this is industrial forest, essentially. So we kind of parted the evergreen huckleberry bushes. We walked into the woods. And this was, I believe, late October or early November. At that time of year, the sun never really gets higher than about this. And even if it's a sunny day, it's not enough to dry out the woods. The moment you walk in the woods, it's like walking through a car wash, okay? Doug, he didn't have a shred of Patagonia on him, okay? There was no fleece, there was no Gore-Tex, all right? He was wearing an old hoodie that he picked up while Morel picking somewhere in Oregon and, uh, you know, his regular work boots and a pair of jeans. And uh, he parted the bushes and started heading up the slope. And I followed Doug and uh, the terrain got gnarlier and gnarlier. And we were catwalking on trees and swinging from limbs. And he, as you can see, has pretty long loping legs and sort of he started to gain on me a little bit. And pretty soon as we headed up this ridge, I couldn't see him anymore. And, uh, and then there was a certain point where I couldn't hear him either. And at that moment, a sort of paranoid thought crossed my mind. And I thought, well, what if it's kind of like, you know, with Air Force pilots or firemen or cops, you know, kind of masculine professions? What if he's, you know, what if he's just trying to like, maybe turn me around a little bit in the woods and see if I can find my way out? What if he's sort of testing me right now to see if I'm tough enough to follow him? And as soon as that paranoid thought crossed my mind, I heard his voice up ahead. He was yelling for me, come on, get up here. And, uh, and I banished all further negative thoughts about Doug because he really did want to show me what you know was behind his sort of working life. And uh, I got up there to the ridge and stood with him. And I looked over the edge and down in this sort of ravine, it was just carpeted as far as I could see with hedgehog mushrooms, just as just the woods, as far as I could see. And uh, on that day, I believe he picked about 40 pounds of them. And, uh, and he showed me exactly the sort of terrain that he went to, to look for these mushrooms. And what he was looking for in this industrial forest, you can see, and by the way, there are a lot of hints in these slides. So if you ever make it out to the Pacific Northwest, there are a lot of secrets here just revealed in the tree types and the backgrounds. And so look carefully, but notice all that cedar slash that's left over from the original cut. These woods were probably logged in the 1930s or even earlier. And, uh, but the, back in those days, the loggers thought the wood was gonna go on forever. Um, and they left a lot of stuff behind. They left big stumps and they left slash and they left logs that just weren't deemed good enough for the mill or whatever. <clears throat> and now that stuff is treated like found treasure. Uh, and there are still people who go into the woods known as shake rats who will haul, haul out these old sort of remnants from the original cut more than a hundred years ago. But anyway, all of that old cedar decaying into the ground is what creates the great mushroom flush. Now the hedgehogs, they were mycorrhizal with another species. OK, it might have been the spruce that was in there. It could have been the Douglas fir. It was a diff it wasn't the cedar, but he was looking for those old cedar deposits for his patches. And uh, and you can see these beautiful spreader hedgehogs um, that he's got in his hand here. Here's a little close up. New, uh, by the way, new uh, Latin name for that in the last few years. Um, and I have updated all the taxonomy in the new edition of the mushroom hunters. Um, but uh, there, they, there, there it is. You can see the spines, the telltale hedgehog-like spines underneath the caps. One of my favorite mushrooms, just a very, very sort of robust mushroom with really complicated flavor profile, um, kind of almost exotic with like 
hints of chocolate and clove and coffee and things like that. And one of the things, one of the reasons why the restauranters love it so much is they last a good two weeks in the fridge. Um, they really hold, hold up well. They command a good price. Um, so on that particular day, I think he was getting about $6 per pound. And I believe he picked about 40 pounds of hedgehogs. So that was my first outing with Doug. And then he introduced me to his picking partner, uh, another guy who had done a stint as a commercial fisherman as he had, and they had bonded over that. Um, and uh, you can see here, Jeff with some nice button porcini mushrooms uh, from what they call the beach pick, where every October on the Washington coast, the porcini will come up literally within a stone's throw of the Pacific. Um, and uh, it's a very, very important pick for these guys. And here is Jeff with a five pound cauliflower mushroom, which on that day, he probably sold that for $25 to the buyer. Um, and the buyer probably turned around and sold it to a restaurant for about $50. Uh, since then, those prices have just gone up. And here they are together with some nice golden chanterelles picked on the on the Washington coast. So um, that was kind of my entree into this world. Um, Doug, some of his picker friends who I got to know, and I just started going out with these guys um, and joining them on picks in Washington, in Oregon, even, even down to Northern California, um, out to Montana or Idaho, places like that. Um, Doug used to go up into BC quite a bit, but he was having some problems with the Canadian authorities. Um, and so that wasn't on the agenda. Um, but we will, we will talk about Canada later because I did make it up to Canada, Canada eventually. So that's sort of one half of the equation, right? And I, as I got to know this kind of business better and kind of learn how these guys were, how they were doing, how they were picking these improbable quantities of fungi, like who would do this, you know, this sort of stoop labor, um, you know, it just seemed, it just seemed so kind of, um, I don't know, it seemed superhuman um, to me at first, but as I started learning more about it and how they thought about it, and the fact that these patches in, in many cases, they were like hand-me-downs, um, and with family members, they might learn patches or from friends. Um, and so, you know, between just sort of going out and, uh, and just scouring the woods, doing tons of scouting, um, and then having patches sort of handed down, you know, over time, they developed what they would call a portfolio of patches. You know, um, think of it as a diversified stock portfolio. So you've got your early patch and your late patch. You have your high elevation patch and your low elevation patch. You have all you have your patch for the dry season and your patch for the wet season. All kinds of different patches. So depending on what Mother Nature throws at you, you're ready. Um, and that's getting increasingly important with climate change, by the way. So the pickers were kind of one half of this equation. And I really thought of it as kind of a frontier style capitalism, really the sort of last vestiges um, of this kind of Wild West style of, um, of free market. Um, but then on the other side of the equation, you had the buyers, okay? Um, and uh, the two sides didn't always get along. Um, so I eventually got to know this buyer who has a business in Seattle called Foraged and Found Edibles. This is Jeremy Faber. He's a New Yorker. He's a fast talking New Yorker. He actually went to college. He went to college for, um, for forestry. Uh, and then he'd always had cooking jobs, came out West. He was working in restaurants, uh, but he wanted to be out in the woods. He was actually working at a very fancy restaurant um, where he could have been eventually the head chef, but instead he was spending a lot of his time in the woods uh, and was bringing back these incredible wild delica delicacies to incorporate into different, you know, daily specials and that sort of thing. And eventually he realized he just needed to be in the woods. So he started, quit his job, started this business. Uh, and, uh, and I got to know Jeremy. Um, you can see he is leaning on a bunch of baskets there. Those are the baskets that the mushrooms get traded back and forth in. They, they can be stacked. They can go into a walk-in cooler or the back of a pickup truck. 
Um, and that's what these mushrooms are constantly being traded around in. Um, and here is his basement. Um, basically, the, the business started out of his home. And so they had a sort of little mini warehouse in the basement. There's one of his employees um, there, you know, dusting off the mushrooms and getting them ready for shipment. Um, eventually, he would expand into a real ware warehouse. Uh, but at first, when I first got to know him, he was just working out of his home. Um, and uh, here he is uh, talking with Sang um, over on the Olympic Peninsula in Raymond, Washington, which is sort of southwestern. Washington on the peninsula, on the, right on the coast. Um, and, uh, and Sang was one of his sort of network of pickers that he cultivated. And he had to have a network all over the Pacific Northwest because, of course, different species are fruiting at different times in different places. And you need to have pickers all over the place and you need to move around. Um, and so right here, Sang is offering up his home on the Washington coast as essentially a buy station, okay? Um, and so I journeyed with Jeremy out to the coast to Sang's house one night. And I can remember being in the driveway. Um, and uh, just as we pulled in, uh, I noticed that a few people who were hanging around who had baskets of mushrooms just started furiously texting on their phones. And the next thing you knew, about 30 people arrived within the next five minutes, all with baskets overflowing with mushrooms. So the word went out, the buyer was in town, everybody showed up with their mushrooms. And so then the grading process began. And it was very operatic. Um, it sort of had its ebb and its flow, and it went on for hours. And I would watch this grading process time and again. Um, and it, was, it, never, it never ceased to be fascinating. Uh, to me. So here, this is mostly porcini um, that's being graded. And in fact, you can see that um, every number one button would be cut in half and checked for worms. Um, and I would see beautiful, pristine looking buttons get shunted aside, such as this one right here. Um, now, I don't have a pointer, but I don't think it's too hard to see up in the left top of the cap there, you see that little yellow? Those are actually the eggs of some sort of bleat gnat, okay? It's laid those eggs, and within 24 hours, that is going to be a writhing mass of maggots, essentially, okay? Especially because as soon as it warms up, all those eggs are gonna hatch, and the worms are gonna start burrowing around, okay? So when I first saw that, to me, it looked like just a pr pristine number one porcini button. And I couldn't believe it was getting shunted aside. And Jeremy just casually said, that's gonna be a wormy mess in a couple hours. Okay, grading continued on. The picker who had picked that mushroom just shrugged his shoulders, he knew. Um, and uh, so somebody's gonna eat it probably for dinner, but nobody's gonna pay for that mushroom, okay? So all the porcini got cut in half and then weighed and, uh, and, and graded uh, basically on a scale of one to three. And the threes were dryers and they would command a fraction of the price. The number one buttons are what the chefs pay top dollar for because they're, I mean, you guys are probably all porcini pickers here. You know, those number one buttons are firm. They have that beautiful mushroom profile. So when you cut them in half and you slice them like that, they have a beautiful mushroom kind of uh, image there. And, uh, and they're just chefs love to cook with those number one buttons. So they command the highest price. And then the, the number twos are mushrooms that are slightly bigger and more mature than the number ones, maybe a little bit softer. Sometimes they're my favorites because they can be quite large, but still really good. Um, but they don't command the same price as the number ones. So you can see on this particular day, this picker, uh, probably after scouring the beach scrub on the Washington coast for a couple hours, made just over a hundred and hundred bucks um, for his for his labor there in a very highly contested pick that has lots of pickers who go back to their patches every day because porcini grows really fast and basically they check their patches every 48 sometimes even every 24 hours for new buttons emerging and that's called cleaning your patch 
and they want to keep their patch clean because they don't want to have any other picker stumbling into their patch and seeing a porcini mushroom that's come up and give away the patch. So they make sure nothing is showing, okay? They clean their patches. But what I really liked was the human drama. So right here, um, you can see some of the wives of the pickers. And I would say um, with the porcini, um, I, I probably in terms of ratios, there were definitely more male pickers than female pickers, um, but often um, it was a family affair. Um, and a lot of the pickers um, were um, from Southeast Asia, um, Laos, Cambodia, to a lesser extent, Vietnam. Um, and this is something that I write about quite a bit in the book. I mean, the immigrant experience is really important to this whole kind of industry. Um, and a lot of these folks, you know, came over probably in the mid 1980s um, up through the 90s and settled in places on the West Coast like Springfield, Oregon, Raymond, Washington, Redding, California. There's certain hot spots. Um, and, um, you know, their stories were unbelievably harrowing. It often, you know, started with fleeing the Khmer Rouge, um, spending a few years in a refugee camp in Thailand, maybe getting to Australia or India or somewhere else, and then perhaps eventually on a boat to Canada and work your way down to the US, um, often taking years trying to keep families together. Um, and one thing I noted, especially um, with the Southeast Asian pickers is it often was a kind of a family enterprise. And so like, I'd come to a house where there was a family from Laos and the grandparents would be out on the stoop kind of cleaning the mushrooms. The parents had done most of the picking and the kids, the teenagers, you know, when they weren't, they'd be in school, but then they'd get home and they'd be the ones doing the heavy lifting, like moving a thousand pounds of mushrooms to the van that was waiting in the driveway, um, which I'll show you some slides from that. But anyway, you can see on this particular night, you can see kind of the, the um, sort of the highs and lows of the grading process. So, you know, there's a lot of gossip that's going on and exchanging of stories and a lot of exchanging of native culture because the buy station becomes a place where people from the same, say, community abroad can come together, speak the native language, talk about relatives, talk about people they know in common, whatever. You know, there's plenty of gossip that goes on, but then when it's hubby's turn to get his mushrooms graded, all eyes are on the buyer, okay? And they are watching to see the buyer's hands because he's he's feeling each mushroom and then he's gonna slice it, you know, and they're gonna they're gonna see their profits go up and down with the quality of the mushrooms and whether the buyer catches everything as well and how skilled the buyer is at catching everything. And so you can see the kind of looks of consternation here as they're watching to see what the final profit will be for uh, that day's mushroom picking. So this is all happening in a private home, away from sort of prying eyes. But you know, most of the time, the buyers have to go out and just set up their sandwich board out on a lonely forest service road somewhere, right on the edge of the pick, where the pickers are working, um, you know, and maybe they're on their way back into town and they see on that lonely forest service road, that little sandwich board, and they know they can sell their day's work there. Uh, and sometimes there's more than one buyer set up there. And that's when things get really interesting and that frontier capitalism thing starts. And, uh, and we'll get into that. So this is Darby, Montana. Um, every year there's a fire in the Bitterroot Mountains. Um, and often Darby is a place where the mushroom pickers will go as sort of a central location um, where they can get their groceries and camp and do things like that. Um, and then head up into the foothills to pick burn morels. Um, so on this particular year, I traveled with Jeremy Faber, the buyer, and he set up his sandwich board. And then we, uh, we, it was early in the day, you know, everybody's out in the woods picking. So we hopped in his truck and, uh, actually his truck was in the shop, which often happens. Um, he's got a fleet of Astro vans that he uses, which they don't make Astro vans anymore, but he knows how to find used ones from like you know, 99s, 2000s. 
and he pays a few thousand bucks for them. Um, they're four wheel drive and they have rear air conditioning. Okay, those are two crucial items right there. Um, so his Astro van was in the shop in Derby. Um, and uh, so we took my Subaru and we headed up into the hills and every picker that we saw on the road, he flagged down and asked them where they sold and how much they got. And I think the general price that was going um, for this particular burn was about, I think, I think they were paying uh, about $8 a pound, the different buyers. And there might've been seven different buyers in town. Okay. So every picker we met on the road, Jeremy said, you come by my stand tonight and it's 10. Okay. So we just did that, drove around. We checked out, we actually scouted the burn because Sometimes he'll go out and pick himself because everything he picks is straight to the bottom line, right? There's no middleman involved. So he does a lot of picking during the day as well. Um, and uh, one thing that was kind of interesting on this particular day, uh, you could see all these pickers at the end of the day showed up at his stand because he just raised the price $2, right? And uh, none of the other buyers in town had anybody at their stands. All right. So we're standing there. I'm taking pictures. I'm taking notes. You know, Jeremy's weighing out the morels and there's a white pickup that drives by. And then a few minutes later, I see that white pickup drive by the other way. And I see this a couple more times. And finally, I just and Jeremy had his head down and was and was, you know, doing his work. And I didn't think he noticed anything. But finally, I was like, you know, I keep seeing this car. And he's like the white pickup. Right. I'm like, yeah, he keeps driving by. And he's like, yeah, that's so-and-so. He knows I just pulled into town and I raised the price $2. He's very unhappy with me right now. <laughs> so sometimes it can get a little more heated than that. And these things have to be worked out. Um, and uh, I saw other ways that this would get worked out. Um, which we'll get, get into. Um, so then the mushrooms get back, they get shipped back, um, you know, to the warehouse. In this case, they had to be flown uh, from Montana because everything has to happen quickly. This is a fleeting ephemeral product. Hours are important, especially with morels. You all know how quickly they can go bad, especially in the heat. Um, they need to be refrigerated. They need to be kept cool um, during the day. Um, when he didn't have access to refrigeration, the baskets would be stored along the banks of a creek because it would be 10 degrees cooler. Um, little things like that. Um, and then uh, they get back to the warehouse, they get cleaned off by the employees, boxed up into the, the nice little package there with the sticker slapped on the company. And then there's a fleet of vans and employees who drive them around to restaurants or they get dr driven to SeaTac and flown down to San Francisco or New York or Europe because they love their morels in Europe. And, uh, and so they're going all over the world. Here is a well-known restaurateur in the Northwest who just passed away recently, Ron Zimmerman, um, who has a well-known restaurant called The Herb Farm. And uh, he's taking a nice collection there of golden chanterelles from one of Jeremy's employees. Um, can see the chef in the background. That guy who was working for Jeremy talking to the chef used to be colleagues with the chef, worked at this restaurant, could have been wearing those white chef clothes, um, but instead decided that he wanted to go into the wild food business. So I'd be curious to know what their conversation was like at that moment. Um, but anyways, Ron was taking this collection of golden chanterelles for an annual uh, dinner that he does in the month of October called the Mycologist Dream Menu. And uh, you all might enjoy this menu. Uh, and if you have a few hundred bucks just burning a hole in your pocket, then, uh, then go for it because it's pretty pricey. It's uh, about nine courses and uh, every course has wild mushrooms in it, including dessert in which they give you a nice candy cap custard or something like that. Um, so it's a super fun Super fun event, uh, but uh, but yeah, that is that's the sort of restaurant that really knows how to use this kind of product. And then 
I would go even to New York City, where while I was writing the book, Jeremy was kind of opening up a little toehold on the East Coast and started up a little warehouse in Brooklyn um, in order to basically supply some of New York City's most famous restaurants um, with wild foods from the Northwest. Um, and so here we were unloading the van at Newark and then, you know, fighting our way back through the Holland Tunnel, you know, with the morning rush hour. Um, and actually, this was the day when Obama showed up in New York. And so we had to make sure to get all our deliveries done before 2 p.m. when we knew the city would literally shut down. Um, and uh, and we did. Um, but I went to Momofuku and all sorts of other really well-known Manhattan eateries that were all using Jeremy's um, mushrooms. So here is another shot of those beautiful blonde morels that come out of uh, Southern Oregon. Um, this was in Sisters actually, where he set up, and I'm gonna take you through some of the famous patches uh, where these guys go. The patch here in Sisters, Oregon is well known uh, for both morels and spring porcini. And you can see the forest service in Oregon is probably um, the most organized. I mean, they're really, they're pretty intense about having permits, making sure the pickers have permits and they will check and they will pull people over on the highway. It's a little more loosey goosey in Washington. And then in Northern California, a lot of the pickers just stay out of Northern California because as David Aurora likes to point out, Nor Northern California has sort of taken this museum under glass approach to the natural world. And uh, they've essentially closed off almost everything to much, including recreational mushroom picking. Uh, we don't want to go that route, by the way. I mean, it's very hard to pick mushrooms now in Northern California. Um, but, uh, but anyways, Jeremy set up uh, at Sisters, and because it was a nice day, he didn't need his canopy. And here he is just grading uh, mushrooms out in a essentially a campground in the Nash Desch Deschutes National Forest. Um, this woman came by with some beautiful blonde morels. I was really intrigued by the number seven on her sweater. Not, I should have asked her what that meant. Um, and here's Jeremy with some beautiful, this is spring porcini, by the way. Um, you may know that out in my neck of the woods, we have both spring porcini and fall porcini. The spring porcini is Boletus rex veris, uh, which basically translates as spring king. Um, beautiful variety of porcini. Um, super tasty. Um, and here we are um, on, the, on the border of Montana and Idaho at about 7,500 feet. And we're looking into Idaho. So there was a burn here and I went with Jeremy to scout it. And what Jeremy is doing right now is he's using those binoculars to really get a sense of where he wants to go and also where he is going to tell his pickers to go. Um, and so you see all this sort of blackened stuff in the sort of foreground of the hills there. That's the hot burn. Remember I showed you that slide at the beginning. I said that wasn't such good habitat where I was picking with my friend. That's that same sort of hot habitat. And the pickers call it hot burn. This is where the fire burns is sort of a crown fire. It kills all the trees. They're just black and sparse and the ground is covered with ash. There will be morels in these spots, but they are exposed to the wind, they're exposed to the sun. And then when it rains, all that ash just splashes up into the pits of the morels and the pickers and buyers call that ash splash. And it makes for really unpalatable morels. They're sandy, it's hard to get that ash out of them. What the pickers are looking for, and this is why Jeremy is up there looking from elevation down into the burn, he wants to find what the pickers refer to as the red needle burn, okay? The red needle burn is where the fire came through as a creeper fire, doesn't kill most of the trees. It'll blacken them, but most of the trees will survive, but they are stressed and they will drop their needles and it will form a really beautiful red needle duff that just holds in the moisture and can really grow morels when the conditions are right. So the interior of a good sort of red needle burn kind of looks like this. So you can see the nice carpeted duff there, right? 
Um, but notice all the greenery in the background. You can see that all these trees have been wounded. They're gonna carry those fire scars for the rest of their lives, but most of them have survived, okay? Um, this is the kind of habitat you look for. And when conditions line up, you get rain at the right time, the temperatures are good, all of that, the tree canopy, it's the right tree composition. You get a lot of that good true fur in there. It can look like this. Yeah, makes your eyes red just looking at it, doesn't it? <laughs> That's from Cheech and Chong. <laughs> um, so see those big ones? The pickers call those hand grenades. Those are seriously, those are those would be bigger than the palm of your hand. Um, so I would see going out with Jeremy and Doug and the other pickers, I would see this kind of thing time and time again. Um, in the frame of this photo, there are probably 10 pounds of mushrooms, just, just in this one photo. Now, of course, the entire forest doesn't look like this. You might then have to hike another mile to find a patch like that. But this is the kind of stuff that the mushroom pickers are looking for. Um, now, I don't know how easy it is to see in this slide because he's wearing a black shirt, but if you can see, he's holding the hem of his shirt in his teeth. Do you see that? That's because the bucket is out of reach, okay? Now, the way he would do it is he'd wear a pack board, the same sort of pack board that an elk hunter might use, except it's got mushroom bags, baskets stacked up rather than meat bags um, that are lashed to the pack board with bungee cords. And then he has a bucket. The bucket's probably seven, eight gallons. The bucket might hold 15 pounds of mushrooms. Each one of those baskets holds 12 pounds of morels, okay? So um, we'll go into a spot, we'll see something like this. He'll put down his pack, he'll use his bucket, he will make circles, okay, to be efficient, okay? Um, and he will pick everything, but at a certain point, he'll probably drop the bucket because he's just got to gather everything that's kind of right in the immediate area, but he needs something else. So he puts the hem of his shirt in his teeth and he makes a bucket out of his shirt, okay? These are the little efficiencies that make the difference between a picker who's gonna do 80, 100 pounds of mushrooms in a day and another guy who's gonna do 40 or 50, okay? So here's a close up of Jeremy getting ready to pick a nice burn morel. And you can see he's holding his shirt and his teeth and it's loaded with maybe five pounds of mushrooms just in the shirt. And then he's gonna dump that in the bucket and then he's gonna make a bigger circle and eventually come back to where his pack is. And then he's gonna go somewhere else. Okay, so he's making circles within circles within circles, essentially. Um, and that's how you clean a patch. Um, so here's a shot of his pack board and you can see the size of his bucket that he's using a big old bucket. Um, and uh, when you stack those baskets up there, it gets un unwieldy. Carrying a hundred pounds of, of morels out of the bush is no, is no easy feat, especially considering you're often kind of catwalking on trees and jumping over burned logs and trying to dodge widow makers and all of that, but that's how it's done. Uh, and notice all the greenery here, okay? This is the sort of thing that the mushroom pickers are looking for. This is an underground seat right here, and that's why it's so green. This place was loaded with morels. That underground seat, noticeable by the foliage, was exactly the sort of thing that Jeremy was looking for. Um, so here's some of the species. Um, some of you might be familiar with these. Um, over in the left front, basically the first flush of burn morels are referred to collectively by the pickers and buyers as conica. And conica is an out of date Latin name that applies to Europe, but doesn't apply to North America. Um, but still it's an industry term. And there's maybe three or four different species that need to be told apart with a mic with a microscope. You can't eyeball them, um, and uh, and so you, you you need to look at the spores, etc. Um, but then we have this very large morel, which the picker, confusingly, the pickers call grays and blondes. They are the same species. Um, this is the only burn morel that you actually can identify by species. Um, in the burn by looking at it because they're so distinctive um, and they can get quite large. And you can see in the right, 
side here, that's the blonde color phase. And in the rear left, that's the gray color phase. So it has two different color phases just to make it a little more confusing. And then the fact that in the Midwest, Midwesterners refer to blondes, totally different species of morel. That's Morcella americana, which we generally call yellow morels where I live. Um, I don't know what you all call those. Yellows, blondes, what do you guys call them? Anybody pick Morcella americana? They grow down in the cottonwoods of the river valleys. Anyway, the nomenclature is very confusing, um, but uh, but these are some of the burn morels, and uh, and then a lot of the morels get dried because they get shipped over to Europe where they're crazy about morels. Um, much easier to ship ship a dried product. So this was at the base of uh, Blue Pass in Washington where there was a burn, and there was just hundreds of pounds of morels out on screens uh, being dried and then shipped over to Europe. So, um, you know, often foods that appear at the same time really go together, you know, the seasonality. So for instance, like um, asparagus and fiddleheads or morels, that sort of thing. Well, another thing that's coming up at the same time as the morels are spring Chinook salmon in the Columbia River. So I really like to, uh, to pair a springer, as we call them, with, uh, with my morel catch, and then a little uh, red wine from the Willamette Valley to the south of me in a reduction there. Um, that's one of my favorite dishes to make to just sort of evoke the earthiness of the spring. Um, but as we kind of move out of the morel season, which sometimes, I mean, where I live, it could go into October if conditions are good. You just go up higher and higher in elevation if you get the rain. So I was just picking morels, I don't know, maybe 10 days ago. Um, and we did get some rain. So when I get back home, maybe in a week or so, I'm going to go check the burns and see if they're still producing. But it's not uncommon to be able to pick burn morels until August and some years, September and October. But a lot of the pickers, really, they'll sort of focus on sort of May and June, maybe into July. But then once it's July, you know, unless they're heading up into BC and the Yukon, if they're staying down more in sort of Washington, Oregon, they might shift their focus a little because that's when we start getting into the lobster mushroom harvest, okay? Sometimes as early as July. Um, the forest can be bone dry when lobsters start coming up. A lot of people just don't realize that they're out there. Um, but, you know, when you start seeing a lot of them, once the rains gather force, that's more like September, October, a lot of them are past their prime at that point. When you find them in July and August, they're just bright orange and hard as rocks and just delicious. Um, so a lot of pickers will start hunting lobster mushrooms. Um, as you know, that's a twofer type of fungus that's parasitizing another type of fungus. Um, in this case, Russula brevipes, um, and turning it in the process into a bright orange delicacy, uh, which is becoming a lot more popular with chefs all over the country. 15 years ago, kind of a novelty. These days, you will see lobster mushrooms, you know, for sale in farmer's markets. You'll see them in restaurants. Um, they've definitely kind of gained in popularity in recent years, and, uh, and I do like them a lot. But the mushroom that really kind of gets the pickers sort of changing over to a new species. It's the mushroom that most Northwesterners start with. Um, and it's probably, there are probably more of this mushroom picked than morels, but I would say the prices they command are never as high, uh, but it's often the mushroom that gets people started and I'm talking about these guys right here, Pacific Golden Chanterelles. Um, it's a high volume pick um, and often the prices are not as good um, as morels. The habitat in the Northwest where most of this picking is done, and I know you guys pick chanterelles, but the commercial harvest is really primarily um, in the coastal mountains of Washington and Oregon. Up into Southern BC, down into Northern California, 
but I would wager that the Southern Olympic Peninsula is probably the heart of the North American um, harvest. I've heard there's good, good uh, chanterelle picking in Saskatchewan and in the woods of Maine, but there are probably more chanterelles coming out of the Southern Olympic Peninsula than anywhere else. And this is what it looks like. And in the frame of that photo, there is not a single stick of old growth forest. That is all second growth Douglas fir. That is all timberland. And that is where the harvest is happening because it turns out that the Pacific golden chanterelle is mycorrhizal with young Douglas firs. So the timber industry in the Northwest has inadvertently created a boom in chanterelles uh, by logging all the old growth Douglas fir essentially, and then planting these tree farms of Douglas fir, which they cut on short rotations, often as soon as 40 years. But that happens to be right at sort of peak chanterelle harvest time. You know, kind of 25 to 50 year old trees is sort of what the pickers are looking for. Um, and uh, it's a fun pick, although the woods are a little more dreary, I think. Um, you know, this is industrial forest. But when you come down a hillside that's just littered with gold, uh, it's really something to behold. Um, and, uh, and it's a quantity game. You got to pick a lot of chanterelles. Um, so here I am with uh, Doug and Jeff on this particular day. And we were out on the Olympic Peninsula. Um, this is sort of a, an old spur on the top of a ridge. This area has probably been logged three times or more. Okay. These trees look like they're in the maybe, you know, 25 year class. And basically, they would dive off either side of this um, old logging spur on top of the ridge and just zigzag down the hillside picking chanterelles. And they started um, maybe a half mile from the car and they would fill the bucket and make their way back to the car and get some water and then go and then and then go to the next spot, which was a little closer to the car. And by the end of the day, they they were basically picking around the car. Um, and uh, so here's Doug. Um, you know, emptying a, a bucket into one of the baskets in the car that he affectionately calls the blue pig. Um, and, uh, and at the end of the day, they each picked 60 pounds of chanterelles. Um, so, you know, just staggering quantities of mushrooms that just routine, and that was sort of not a great day, you know. Um, and I think on this particular day, he was getting paid um, maybe $4 a pound for these chanterelles. Um, at the beginning of the season is when the pickers get their best price. This past year, we had our worst chanterelle season that I that I can remember in 30 years of picking mushrooms. It just it didn't rain until October, till late October in the Northwest. Uh, and the pickers were getting like 13 bucks a pound for chanterelles. Um, and, uh, and that price actually stayed. Normally, it would be a high price for the first couple of weeks. And then there's a glut, the price dives down. And then at the end of the season, it starts to creep up again. Um, but generally speaking, it's a high volume pick. Uh, remember I told you about the thousand pounds of chanterelles that I helped move? Um, well, there it is. So that was in a Cambodian family's uh, garage. Um, and as I mentioned, the whole family, um, was working on that pick together. That was probably a week's work. Um, and they got $2 a pound for that. So about $2,000, um, which yeah, seems um, like not very much for the, for the amount of work that it takes. Um, I guarantee you that this sort of meal would not be happening in the kitchen of that, <laughs> above that garage later. Um, but, uh, everything that they picked got sold. Um, but I had the luxury of taking my little bits home and making up good meals like this gnocchi with a, um, with a chanterelle, um, sauce, um, made with, um, I think some, some beef shanks actually. And with the baby chanterelles that are sort of at the beginning of the season, when they're small and really firm. Um, which are some of my favorites actually, and have caps that are generally smaller than a quarter. 
I like to pickle those. Um, they're really good candidates for pickling. Slice them in half or in quarters, or even if they're small enough, just use the whole button. Um, so the chanterelle harvest goes on for months. And um, it, it, as I mentioned, it's a pretty high volume pick. Uh, and there's a certain point where everybody is just sick of chanterelles. You know, it's a lot of work. There's a lot of carrying of baskets. There's a lot of weighing. There's a lot of just humping mushrooms out of the woods. Um, and so it's nice for the pickers to be able to do something else. And if they want to, as the season gets a little later, um, they can head out to central Oregon to Shemult. Don't blink or you might miss it as you drive through. Um, and they can hunt um, along the spine of the Cascades where there's very nice volcanic pumice that's almost like sand. Um, and the woods are surprisingly dry. You might think too dry for mushrooms, um, but that is exactly the sort of habitat where probably the country's most famous matsutake pick is happening, um, right near Crater Lake. Um, and a lot of it is due to those volcanic soils. Um, so Matsutake really likes the sandy soils right along the coast. So you can find them where you find the Porcini right next to the Pacific or along the spine of the Cascades where that volcanic ash kind of creates the same sort of soil type as the sand. Um, and um, this is a very intensive two month pick that happens on the Deschutes Forest um, every year, starting the day after Labor Day. Um, and it's very closely monitored by the Forest Service. Um, I've joined it several years. Um, the first year, I think when I took most of these photos, um, the pickers were getting about $20 a pound for number ones and number twos. And then I went back a few years later and they were getting $5 a pound. Um, so that gives you a sense of sort of the flux of uh, how these things go up and down. Um, and they camp out in the National Forest, and you can see all over the place these sort of post and stringer uh, camps with tarps over them, um, and often whole family groups camping. Somebody's doing chores like cooking and laundry and that sort of thing, while others are picking. Um, and it's, you know, like a little consortium. Um, and you will see signs around in several different languages um, telling the pickers not to rake. Um, for many years, there was raking of the Matsutake buttons uh, because the, the, the prized Matsutake buttons, the number ones, are often not visible above the duff. They're poking up and they make those mushrooms, right? Those little bumps in the duff. And the pickers would use rakes to sort of rake away the duff and uncover the buttons, okay? Well, this was having a deleterious effect on the forest. Um, they outlawed it. And now they are only allowed to use a little sort of probe that they can feel down there for a mushroom button. Um, but the really good pickers, they don't need the probe. They know where the Matsutake buttons are. As I mentioned before, they have a portfolio of patches. It's like they know the zip codes of these mushrooms. They go to the same tree year after year. They know exactly which trees produce the Matsutake and when, and they go back. And these patches do get handed down like family heirlooms. Um, and so here is Joy, who was a buyer, but also did some picking. Um, and I seem to have lost my advance again. Hmm. Okay, let's try a different way of doing it. I'm just going to click it. Yep. There we go. So there's Joy, who was a field buyer, but also a picker. You can see he's got one of those little probes there. I don't know if you can see the cap. It's barely visible. There's a tiny little bit of white that he's uncovered there. It was completely covered with duff. He knew exactly where to go to find that mushroom. Um, I went out with him, and, uh, and then I hung around in town with a bunch of the different buyers. Here, you can see they look dirty, I know, but those are number one Matsutake buttons. And almost certainly they are going to go to Japan. About 90% of the pick ends up in Japan um, and um, it gets auctioned and it goes for a lot more money 
than what the pickers and buyers are throwing around on this side of the pond. Um, but those Japanese buyers at auction want to see that dirt on the mushroom. And above all, they don't want the stipe cut. You never cut the end, okay? They want to know that that matsutake made the long journey across the ocean with the life force still attached to it, the dirt. Uh, and they want to see that. Um, so the matsutake, it's okay for it to be dirty. Um, and, uh, and that's how it gets picked. And then you start seeing the buy stations around town, of which I think the first year I went, there might have been 20, maybe even 30 buyers just in this area of Shamal. And they were in all kinds of crazy places. Ooh. A defunct filling station um, or the ever increasingly popular shipping container, um, which you know makes a lot of sense because at the end of the season, you just close up the doors, you hitch it up to the truck and you drive it to the next you know, patch on the mushroom trail and it's bulletproof. <laughs> and I, I kid, but a lot of the pickers do carry guns. Um, and this was one of the things, there've been a number of articles over the years. Um, there was one in the Seattle Times and there've been others that talk about the gun play in the woods. Um, a lot of the pickers carry guns just for communication is what I discovered. Um, especially if you're picking with other partners, you know, one shot means I'm over here, two shots means I'm in trouble, that sort of thing. Um, there were other pickers. Um, I did meet pickers from Southeast Asia who carried guns because they were afraid of the wildlife. Now, I've been picking around bears and cougars all my life, and I'm not, you know, I've never had a problem. But I suppose if you come from a jungle country where you're used to dealing with tigers and other animals like that, you might be a little nervous about it. So that was that was a reason that I was given quite a bit about the guns. But generally speaking, you know, the rumors were always that it was about kind of defending patches and intimidating other people and that sort of thing. I did not run into that. OK, um, Although I do have one chapter about Northern California. Um, I'm not gonna go deeply into it now, but I think that was a result of other social ills, uh, including um, you know, methamphetamine and some other things. But our camp was disrupted by some gun, gun play, but I don't think it had anything to do um, with mushroom picking. Um, so, you know, you do hear a lot about guns. And when I first embarked on this book project, my wife just emphatic, emphatically said, no, you're not doing that. Um, but I eventually convinced her. And, um, and really, I think that anything that you may have heard about gun play in the woods has probably been exaggerated. Um, here um, are the pickers at the end of the day. Um, they've been picking Matsutake. You can see this guy on the left, he did pretty good. He's got a good wad of dough. He made $500 that day. Um, you know, hanging out, the buy station is in the back there. Hanging out in Matsutake camp was some of the most fun that I had while I was writing the book. It's kind of like being in steelhead camp or, you know, fish camp. People sitting around the fire at the end of the day, telling stories, a lot of lies, maybe trying to throw their competitors off the scent a little bit, you know, maybe throwing out some information that isn't quite right, you know, that kind of stuff. And, uh, and it was just a lot of fun to hang around Matsutake camp. And then at a certain point, um, a truck pulls in. Well, this is the truck that all the buyers have gone in on and pay for this guy. And he shows up at camp every night and he picks up all the Matsutake, which has been tagged. Um, you know, the field buyer has got a headset on if he's got phone service and he's talking to his boss and he's giving him the numbers um, and everything is graded and tagged and written down in a book and all the, you know, the money that changes hands. But most important, that Matsutake is raced to the airport. And by the end of the night, that truck will be filled with Matsutake from all the different camps. Um, and it'll go off to Portland or to the airport in Bend, Oregon. Um, and, uh, and then probably within 24 hours, it's, you know, sitting on the tarmac, you know, in Kyoto or somewhere. Um, and goes to auction just the way bluefin tuna does. Um, even in Matsutake camp, we had a noodle house. I'm sure you could get a $2 bowl of pho at the end of the day. I'm sure that this was not permitted. 
Um, but the food was delicious. It only operates the two months of Matsutake season, uh, and then it's taken down. Um, and while I was there, there was a big ceremony going on. There was some money being raised to build a Buddhist temple. Um, and there were a bunch of monks running around. And this particular monk got a $5 donation from me. And with that, he blessed my book project. Um, so I was very thankful for that. Um, so, um, you know, just like the other mushrooms, the mushroom pickers are back in camp. And you, there are delicious smells that are wafting out of all the different camp pots around. And by the way, there were probably about 3,000 people camping and picking matsutake this particular year. Um, wonderful smells coming out of camp. The fires are going everywhere, um, but nobody's eating matsutake. You know, I'm the only one taking matsutake home. Uh, and when I get my matsutake home, I really like to do it in traditional uh, mostly Japanese ways, although I also do some Sichuan style cooking of matsutake. But this is a classic Japanese way of doing it um, with a very, very simple fish broth, um, really made with just a few manila clams and some fish bones. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then the mushroom gives it that extra special, you know, flavor. As David Aurora says, you know, the provocative compromise of red hots and dirty socks, <laughs> which is actually, I think, pretty flavorful. Um, you know, it took me a while to learn to love matsutake, but I have to say I do. Um, and especially in um, the various Japanese dishes that I do, I think it just works better with soy sauce and rice vinegar um, and sesame oil and things like that, rather than say Western ingredients like olive oil and butter and cream and cheese. Um, here's another uh, dish that I like to make, just a classic kind of Sichuan preparation. Um, you don't even, you don't need the chicken because matsutake is so robust. It's so firm um, that it makes a great chicken substitute. And it really, it's so flavorful that it stands up to the hot chilies and the Sichuan peppercorns that are in this dish. But my absolute favorite way to make matsutake, and sometimes I'll see Japanese pickers on the roadside up near Mount Rainier, uh, in Washington with a little hibachi going or a, or a, um, a walk with this um, is sukiyaki. This is, this is my favorite dish to do with matsutake. Again, the matsutake is just flavoring the broth. And the broth is made with soy sauce, um, sake, wine, water, and sugar. It's pretty simple. Um, by the way, I have recipes for all this stuff on my website, so you can you can find these recipes. But this is a really fun dish to do with all your mushroom hunting friends at the end of the night um, or at the end of the day after picking matsutake. You get home and set up what, like a little camp stove in the middle of your table, and just everybody is dipping the ingredients in with chopsticks. It's hot pot, and uh, and you're just you know you've got beef and cabbage and onions and and uh, those uh, cellophane noodles and things like that. And it's just a really fun way to do communal eating. And if you've all been mushroom hunting together, it's even more fun. So, and, it, and the matsutake really elevates the broth to another level. Um, we have one more season to talk about. Um, and that's what the pickers call winter pick because even in the winter months, the mushroom trail is still going. Uh, and the pickers, mostly go down to southwestern Oregon, uh, where there's still a lot of national forests that they can pick. When they get over the border into Northern California, it gets more complicated because so much of it is closed. Some pickers will drift down into California, but most of them are in Southwest Oregon. Um, and again, you'll see, um, you know, the typical sort of mushroom shanties that you see out on the trail uh, that are put together, you know, for a month or two and then taken down, maybe stashed in the woods, maybe thrown in the back of the truck, uh, who knows. Uh, but you can see the little stove pipe coming out. Um, it's probably warm and cozy in there. And the pickers are picking three main species in the winter. Uh, they're picking one of my absolute favorites, the black trumpet. That's probably the most famous of the winter pick mushrooms. Um, and then they're picking yellowfoot chanterelle, which is a relative of the black trumpet. Both of these mushrooms, chefs will tell you, have hints of stone fruit in them, um, a kind of a sweetness that's very interesting. Uh, chefs love them. And then the third is another type of hedgehog mu mushroom that we call you know, a, be a belly button hedgehog because you can see 
this sort of any belly button that it has. Um, this is a different species from the first hedgehog I showed you. They're much smaller, um, but sometimes the ground can just be carpeted with, with these belly button hedgehogs. Um, and they're really good. And this way chefs can be using wild mushrooms in like January and February um, that are fresh. Um, but the same sort of scene, scene would unravel in Brookings on the Southwestern Oregon coast here at the um, coastal blue sweet inn or whatever it was called. I think there were maybe three or four buyers all set up at the same motel with rooms adjacent to each other. And you know, the pickers are always complaining that the buyers are sort of doing things that are maybe slightly illegal, you know, like setting price limits and, uh, you know, discussing things that that typically are considered, you know, um, not, not kind of legal. Um, and then, you know, the buyers will, uh, will tell the pickers that they should really maybe read up a little bit more on the, on the sort of laws of supply and demand mm -hmm. and all of that. But when you show up at the Blue Coastal Suites Inn in February and you see that every buyer set up here is, um, is, is buying Yellowfoot for 75 cents a pound, then you start to see it from the picker's point of view. You know, at 75 cents a pound, I don't know how you can even pay for your gas to get up into the woods to pick mushrooms, but that's what the price was on that particular day. Um, and I did end up down in California though. Uh, and I went to the Lost Coast with Doug to pick uh, black trumpets. And, you know, Doug has been doing this for so long that one of the things I discovered was that at a certain point, he just didn't even care really about the money anymore. Like in some cases, visiting these patches for him was like visiting old friends, you know? And in this particular patch, he wanted to show me what he called the god awfulest patch of blacks you ever saw, black trumpets. Um, and uh, we spent half the day looking for it. And he's like, I know it's over the next ridge, you know? And when we finally found it, he was so happy. And it was like, you know, it was like he had seen an old friend again. It was also like he had sort of just mastered this sort of, again, nature's Rubik's cube. Um, and he really wanted to show me this great patch. And, uh, and we did finally find it. Of course, J Doug doesn't use a GPS. He doesn't mark his patches. They're all up in his head. You know, that's his Rolodex. Um, but uh, here we are with uh, a few dishes that I like to do with black trumpets. Um, this is a winter risotto with some Brussels sprouts and winter squash. Um, a really tasty way um, to eat black trumpets. And then it's always the garnish on my cream of chanterelle soup. Um, I like to say that the black trumpet kind of out shanties the chanterelle. It's, it's a kind of intense distillation of chanterelle flavor. Um, and as a garnish, it's perfect. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, from the get-go, what started me on this project was just wanting to understand how people could go into the woods and, and kind of, you know, figure out nature's secrets to the degree that they could actually make a living, you know, picking wild mushrooms, which just seems so improbable to me. Um, and I knew that some of these guys could pick as much as like a hundred pounds in a day. Um, and that big fat round figure, a hundred pounds kind of became my white whale. Um, you know, I really wanted to see if I could do that, you know? And so I finally had my chance when I went up to the Yukon. And this was really what I had been looking for all along. I wanted to get up and do the sort of wilderness pick that I'd heard these guys talk about. I mean, most of the time we were in national forests and places where we were, you know, we were a couple hours from town and, uh, you know, if something went wrong with the rig or whatever, you know, we could get it fixed. Um, but up here, you know, it's moose and grizzly bears. And, uh, and so there was a big burn, um, you know, just on the border between BC and the Yukon. And so Jeremy Faber, who, had orders coming in from restaurants all over the country. 
he needed a big takedown. He'd sort of run out of the local stuff in the Northwest. Nobody else had morels, and he just had to get up to the Yukon. Okay, so I said, I'm in, I'm going. Um, so we flew up there, you know, we just were in the plane, just going over hundreds of miles of territory, just looking down. He's a backcountry skier as well, and he's just salivating the whole way, um, just wilderness. We fly into Whitehorse. We rent a, an SUV. He wanted a van. They didn't have any vans, so we had to settle for an SUV that could only carry about 800 pounds of mushrooms. Um, and we drove five hours. Um, and we get to the burn site, and immediately he starts the usual checking around to see what the other buyers, who were all Canadian, what they're selling, what they're what they're paying. Well, they were all paying four dollars a pound. So Jeremy immediately raises it to five, and for Gray's six. Okay, and so that first night, pickers start coming into our camp. You know, and we just had a little spike camp right on the edge of the wilderness there, right on the edge of the burn. And so here comes this guy with his morels and uh, and then this woman. And that really gives you a sense of the scale of how big the grays are. Now, I don't advocate mixing a food product with a tobacco product, but, you know, uh, we're up in the Yukon and that's just sort of the way things go sometimes. But you really do get a sense of the sort of size of these. Those are two beautiful grays right there. Um, and then we ran into this woman from Vancouver, that's Margot, and she just was on a lark. She just decided she was gonna pick mushrooms for the summer. And uh, and Jeremy really got a kick out of her motorcycle boots and combat you know, fatigues, and then the homemade mosquito net over the, over the bikini. And so he gave her an extra 25 cents per pound. <laughs> and then you could tell the guy next to her is just happy to be in the photo with her. <laughs> So we're there for a few days and Jeremy's getting all the pickers because he's paying more than the other buyers. And that's when the buyer down the road decided to visit us. So look at these two guys. You notice the body language there? <laughs> you know, a couple of roosters squaring off. So basically the buyer comes over and there's a little chit chat and then he, you know, mentions, ah, oh, so you're, you know, paying five and six, huh? Why, why are you doing that? You know, and Jeremy says, well, look, I'm getting a lot of good mushrooms here. And, uh, and the buyer lets him know that he knows he's an American. And does he have his right paperwork? Does he have permits? You know, he lets him know that he could just make a phone call. That's all it would take, you know? And so, on that day, Jeremy agreed to buy all the rest of that guy's inventory um, at a bargain rate, uh, which he knew wasn't very good because every picker that showed up at Jeremy's stand with subpar mushrooms, he sent down the road to this guy, okay? Because he didn't want to buy any of that stuff. He said, I know there's a buyer down the road that you can buy from. I'm just not going to take that. So he knew he was buying that back at a sort of basement price. It was all going to be dried anyway. But that allowed him to stay up in Canada for another month, uh, which is what he did. Um, and that's how it kind of works in this sort of last vestige of frontier style capitalism going on in the rural fringes of the West right now. Um, and uh, has been going on really since the late 80s. Um, and has become the largest all cash business in North America now that's legal. Um, and uh, so, as I mentioned, um, you know, my goal was to pick 100 pounds. And while I was in the Yukon, uh, that was really a good opportunity. Literally, the moment we stepped out of the car, there was a basket full of mushrooms within about 10 feet of the car um, and we set up our camp there. And we just picked outside of camp for the next week. Um, and uh, Jeremy picked during the day, as I did. And as you know, it's the land of the midnight sun. So we could be out of camp. We could be up at four in the morning having our cop coffee, out of camp at five, you know, pick until, you know, 
eight or nine or even 10 o'clock that night. Um, Jeremy would have to be back. Generally, the pickers started showing up around six or so, um, anytime between six and 10. Um, but, uh, but for me, I had lots of hours that I could pick. And so um, you can see me there with the pack board. I've got four baskets. As I mentioned, each one of those baskets holds about 12 pounds of morels. Out of frame, I'm carrying my big seven gallon bucket, maybe 15 pounds of morels in that. So I've got I probably got close to 65 pounds right there. Jeremy took this picture of me at lunchtime. So we're halfway through um, and I'm more than halfway to my goal of 100 pounds. And uh, to find out what happens, you're just gonna have to read the book. <laughs> so, so this is the new paperback cover. Um, as I mentioned, it's updated with new taxonomy and some other stuff. Um, it comes out in a month, I think August 8th. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is I don't have any copies because it's not out yet. Um, and the hardcover has run through its final printing and is gone. Um, so if you brought a hardcover with you, I'd be happy to sign it. But otherwise, you're going to have to wait another month to get this book. But I hope some of you do. Um, you can pre-order it with your local bookseller. Pre-orders are always really great for authors because publishers look really carefully at pre-orders and the more pre-orders, the better. Um, so if you do pre-order it, uh, thank you. Um, and next time I see you, I will sign it for you. But otherwise I brought a couple of my other books um, and happy to sign those. But, um, you know, I hope, uh, I hope that you learned a few things tonight about the mushroom trade. I, uh, I really enjoyed the few years I spent out on the trail, I am still in touch with Doug. We still go picking together. Um, I'm still in touch with Jeremy. He's sort of a curmudgeon, um, but uh, but we we see each other from time to time, and I'm still out there hanging out with the other pickers and buyers. Um, and I just find it to be a really kind of fascinating little corner of the world. Um, and for people who are into mushrooms. It really, it is, it is just a, a unique thing. Um, and as far as I know, this is just about the only book on the topic. So with that, thank you so much. Any questions? <laughs>